that and answers your question. Thank you very much. And yeah, stay over thank there you. after the panel. I'll give you that 10 bucks I promised you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go to the right. You know, I'm sorry, we are out of time. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that was way too easy. That was like, <laughs> don't do that. Uh, as much as I want to ask you a question from season two, I have to go back to season one, episode 10, because that is my favorite. And in my opinion, the writers gave you the scariest and yet coolest line of dialogue ever. Um, I have to say it, of course, if and no one remembers. Is that how you greet your long lost captain? If you greet me that way, Connor, I cut out your tongue and use it to lick my boots. <laughs> I would love to know, because Tilly exhibits so many traits that are on the autism spectrum, and I'm autistic for 25 years. If the writers do decide to declare autistic, I would love that. But I wanted to ask, once you read the script for Despite Yourself, what was your initial reaction to it? And then before it came time to uh, film that iconic scene for your character, um, how did you prepare for it? I was so excited. I was so, so, so excited. You get these opportunities in sci-fi, and particularly Star Trek, to do just a complete 180 on your character. And they create all these great justifications for it that are really great viable science fiction. And so when I saw, when I saw that I got to do that, I was like, this is why I'm doing Star Trek. So I get this opportunity. And to be honest, like, I have traits of Gilly. Like, I am, I can be tough, you know? And so I was excited to explore that part of myself, too. Not just, like, the weirdo, you know, which is also 95%. Um, so I was so, so excited. I thought that line was so good. But I really, I wanted to nail it so bad. And I really wanted Tilly to be good at playing that part. I didn't want her to fail when she was on, you know? And so I got in that chair and Frakes was directing that episode and he is like, oh, it's such an actor's director because he is an actor and he had my back and he told me what to do to like, he said, when you sit in that chair, you take that moment, you enjoy it, you know? And he like gave me all this stuff and all the support. And so I, I don't know, like it, it was just like such a great, a great moment. I thought the line was so great. I was a little scared to say it to Connor because I had to look him in his eyes and actually say it. Um, but, but it was awesome, and I think it came off well. And I learned so much about Tilly from that episode that she, you know, she's capable. So uh, whatever nerves, all the things that, that she struggles with, in that moment you see, I think, a glimpse not of her ideal captain, but of her as a captain and of her commanding authority, and she's capable of that. You know, and I, I love that moment, and I'm, I'm glad you love it. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Let's go to our left, guys. Hey, guys. My name is Morgan. Pleasure to see all of you. Um, you mentioned earlier, Anthony, that you read and review a lot of books. So I'd love to hear from all of you. What is one book you think everyone should read? Yeah, that's a good question. Should we? Well, I mean, should. People read, I want people to read what they want to read, but um, I, I'm such a huge Ursula Le Guin fan. Uh, it's hard to pick between the two, but The Dispossessed or Left Hand of Darkness, but read both of them. They're just masterpieces. They're, they're about what it means to be human, and they happen, you know, she uses science fiction as this incredible metaphor and window into the human condition in a really amazing way. We're supposed to pick one. Um, well, I think everyone has to read To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, and, you know, my personal favorite book is, well, a, a, along with To Kill a Mockingbird, is Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. So I would add that. But I could go on, I could make a list. I just read Less by Andrew McGreer, which is amazing. You should read that. <laughs> I wish I read more. Uh, I, I feel stupid next to y'all. But, um, but, uh, but a favorite book of mine is uh, This Present Darkness by Frank Peretti. It's a, uh, it is a, uh, uh, angels and demons fighting over a small town without the town people knowing of it, what's going on in that other world. Yeah. Um, I, I'm thinking of a book I read recently. Um, a book called Natives by a, a guy called Carla. Um, and it's a book about a young, a young black kid. And it's, it's non-fiction, just growing up in, in London, but also a look at through that prison looking at British history and, and how it sort of, sort of changes and flips it for you and it's a really
incredible book in its way. I grew up so it's quite a, it's a pretty amazing book. Um, Travels of My Aunt by Graham Greene, I also love. Um, Shakespeare, uh, seriously, but oh, that's a cheat. Um, the book that like changed me most as a as a like teenager would be The Heart Is a Lonely Hunter. I that was the first book where I felt like deeply seen and uh, it was just an, an amazing experience. The most recent book I read that I was crazy about was Manhattan Beach by uh, uh, Jennifer Egan. Um, and I love Visit to Visit with the Goon Squad. Uh, this book is incredible. So I would highly recommend that book. She's an incredible writer. Thank you. Thank you. Before I go to the right, Anthony, you're working on a book, right? You're about to do a short story. Can you talk quickly about that? Yeah. Um, Swapna Krishna, who's a, she, she's been a writer for Sci-Fi Wire, um, the website. Met her at New York Comic Con, and then we've just sort of kept in touch a little bit on Twitter, and she incredibly invited me to contribute a story to an anthology she's putting together with another editor of stories that are inspired by the Arthurian legend, but they they want to do like a gender bending, LGBTQ, diversifying, you know, sort of take it out of the time stream, whatever. And there's some incredible writers that I'm uh, a part of, so I'm, I'm working on a story, I think, that's about Merlin. That is so, so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Let's go to the right. There's such a beautiful diversity both in front and behind the camera for Discovery, and I was curious as actors, how does that diversity play into your dynamic on set? It's a completely different experience, mm -hmm. I have to say. When you don't feel like the only person of color, for instance, or the only queer person in the cast, um, you know, there, there, you feel like, I mean, I can speak for myself. Um, I feel like I, there's so much that I don't feel like I have to explain. Um, and, and um, and just a comfort level that comes with that as well. Um, you know, our writing staff is also very um, diverse, and and our directors. Um, I have to say, to you know, it's the first show I've worked on where I've worked with more than one female director, right? And and a female director of color more than once. So um, there's a there there's something that comes with that comfort you know, in, in your creative process as an artist to know that you are understood on, on multiple levels, for me. It's, it's you know, when I'm, when I'm up and around New York and seeing posters and, and, and billboards for things and, and I still look up and it's like a bunch of white people in a show, like what world are you living in that you're telling stories that are only about white people anymore? It's so nuts. I mean, it's not the planet we're on, you know, and, and, and it's, so it, it's like, yeah, you have to be caught, like I think the creative team and, and the studios and they have to like make a conscious effort because they were like blind to it for so long. When I started out in the business, I was in the, a, a tour of The King and I with Yul Brenner. The King and I, which is a story that takes place in Thailand, or Siam, it's called in the show. And in that production in 1982, there were actors who were white who were playing Asian people. And th thankfully that would not happen anymore, unless you're Scarlett Johansson. But, um, um, so that, but like, that's how blind, they were so blind that they weren't even thinking that there was something weird about that or wrong with that. So now we're finally having real conversations about the importance and necessity of it. But I do want to shout out, like 22 years ago, that Michael Greif, the director of Rent, was somebody who took a stand also for putting together a cast of people, of characters that weren't necessarily written any particular way and making sure that it was populated by all kinds of people. And similarly to Star Trek, no one in that show nor this show ever talks about that fact of each other. That's never a factor. And that is part of the idealism that we are also trying to show is that these, these, these facts of us are facts of us, but they, shouldn't, they don't matter beyond the, the, that they are just part of us, if that makes sense. Right, just to piggyback, I'm sorry, just to, please applaud him, please. <laughs> Like, I mean, especially in this moment, that when, when you are casting an entirely white cast, you are going out of your way to do that at this point. And that feels violent in some way to me. And so I, I just want to say, you know, that's, that's the lie, right? Like when you see a poster of, some, of a, a completely white cast, that's the fake news. I'm going to piggyback on what some uh, point you made was that uh, Gene Roddenberry's actual original vision was to 
was to have that much diversity in the future without anyone having to talk about it because it just is. So um, I feel that both on, and on and off camera with, uh, among our crews, we have, we have lots of differences among us and we don't have to, to bring them up every day at all. It just is. Great, thank you. Guys, I think our great band's gonna play us off in about five minutes, so let's squeeze in as many more as we can. Quick question, please. What was it like to have Tick Notaro join the cast as ah, Good question, thank you. I was gonna ask that. I was a huge fan of hers before she came on the cast, so it was like really exciting, and then it just so happened that I got to do all these scenes with her, so that was even better. Um, and she'd be the first person to tell you that she has a really hard time. <laughs> she has a really hard time remembering her lines. Exercise break. But she doesn't freak out about it. She just like like I don't know. She's like, what is it? So it's she. So it's it's just pleasurable. It's just a joyful pleasure. And she just like she's she's just making us laugh all the time between takes. It's it's she's been an amazing addition to it. I also was a huge fan of takes before she came on the show. It felt so lucky that she was cast. She has been for somebody who has the bone driest wit. She is the nicest, warmest person. And she added this element of like fun to our cast that was so wonderful. I mean, she has you laughing every second. It's hard to catch a breath. You know, she's just so funny and she can't learn lines, but that's fine. Like, she it cuts together very well. Um, and she's, she's been amazing and she's so positive. She's incredibly grateful, wonderful person. We're very lucky to have her. It's one of my one of my favorite scenes from season two was yes. my scene with with Tig yes. um, because we got to see mm -hmm. Culber healing in that moment, um, but also that we were able to talk about our relationships without making a big deal about it once again, and that she got to reveal, you know, her her um, identity as a, a queer person on the show in that moment. So it she is everything. Okay, let's go to the right. Hi, uh, thanks for coming today. It's great to have all of you here today. Um, Jason Isaac said that at the beginning of the filming of season one, he knew Lorca's secret, that he was uh, really from the Mirror Universe. So my question for all of you is, did the rest of the cast know Lorca's secret at the beginning of the filming of the season, or did you find out later as you saw the scripts for the you know, later episodes, and what was your reaction when you found out? Um, I knew, when I first met with uh, the showrunners to talk about the show, they, they did share that with me. And I, I mean, yes, I think it's okay to have known that part. Um, it didn't really spoil anything in terms of, I could still play the scenes with Lorca being the, being the dick that he was. You know? So, you know, it's like, it didn't really matter in the, in the end whether I knew that information or not. But I thought it was really smart and cool. I, yeah, I, th I think Jason told me we would playing tabletop or something, I think he just told me that on one of the first nights. Uh, so yeah, I don't think it affected anything for our team. We all knew that he wasn't going to be with us for the entire season, so it's like, why would he exit? And so I think it kind of came up, you know, as, as it would. I also had to know because Culver was figuring it out, so they needed to tell me. And then that was the reason why I died. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm just going to keep bringing that up for the next yeah. seven years. <laughs> Did you die? Let's go to the left. Um, my question is for Doug, and I was curious on Falling Skies, how your makeup for Saru compares for your makeup for the aliens in Falling Skies. Oh, well, okay, thank you for knowing about Falling Skies. Hey, um, yeah. I, uh, I, played, uh, I played the Volm alien on that show, Cochise was my name. I, uh, he, uh, he, there, there are similarities between Saru and Cochise. Uh, they're both very smart, very articulate, very well spoken. They're, they're written similarly. Uh, in, in their cadence of speech and all that. Um, the makeup, though, uh, Kochi's had eyes that were out here, and so I was looking through little cracks in his face all day, so I was kind of like doing this. Uh, with Cyril, I have my own eyes with those beautiful blue contact lenses, so, uh, that, and that does widen up my, my birth of, of, of vision, which is great. Um, so, yeah, but otherwise, and, and, uh, and, and Kochi's had, had, had flat-footed shoes. So he, he could just walk, yeah, yeah, plus his heart. But thank you for even knowing about that, yeah. Thank you. Let's go to the right. Hi, so my uh, mycelium spore drive is the reason I get hooked on Discovery. So my question is for Anthony Rapp. How does it feel to be portraying the part of a character whose namesake is a legend in, my, in mycology? Yeah, um... 
Well, one of the first things I also learned when I met the, the writers was they talked about Paul Stamets, and then I went and, and watched his TED Talk, which if you have not seen his TED Talk, it's incredible and incredibly inspiring, and the work that he's doing is, is amazing. And, and it didn't even occur to me until I actually met him in person at the premiere of the first season um, that this show would actually might actually help teach the world about the incredible work that he's doing, and it seems like that's happening all the time. Like, we always see people going, oh yeah, that's a real guy. You know, so that's, he's, there, there are things that he talks about which if the science continues to show what he's working on, it could literally save the world and, and some of the terrible things that are happening to our planet. So um, yeah, if you please seek out the real Paul Stamets on, on the interwebs and watch, watch his thing and read his books and everything like that. Okay guys, so the band is out and we've got three people left. So let's make this really fast, let's go through it. Okay, okay. first of all, um, whatever they're paying you, it's not enough. That's true. Let's say that. But I, I just wanted, because the show was just phenomenal. But anyway, do you, um, I guess question is about the CBS All Access. Do you find that the All Access is freeing you to drop the F-bombs and to spread out a little bit more? Or would you find a home on regular CBS? Or just what each of you think about that? Thank you so much. I think streaming gives you that freedom. It opens things up a lot and for a lot for promotion. So I'm, I mean, yeah, I'm in support of that kind of thing. Yeah, I don't think I would have said the F word if we weren't on CBS All Access. So I'm grateful. But plus, even the, even the length of the show. Uh, on broadcast television, they have to edit it down to fit into a slot. On the streaming, they, you don't. If, if it has to go to another page, it goes to another page on the script. That said, if they want to show us on the network, we're okay with that, and we'll overdub the words. <laughs> Real fast, let's get through these last Thank two. You. Just ask a question, please. Thank you. I know many come from a STEM field uh, in the crowd. Uh, I happen to come from a creative field where uh, my training is in arts, uh, sketch, illustration. Uh, I guess I feel in a way closer to you in terms of mindset. Uh, how do you keep yourself sharp uh, professionally versus on your own creatively uh, in your own aspects? Oh, wow. Um, I think it's really important to, to expose myself, continue to expose myself to work, which is why I read a lot, why I watch a lot of plays and, and watch the good Good, good stuff, the good movies, the good... I can't hate watch. Hate watching makes me just sad. I don't try to only watch things that are, that are inspiring. So that's one way that I think that, it, yeah, being, being around other work that speaks to my heart and stirs my mind and stirs my soul helps keep me sharp. I get inspired by these people, you know, by doing scenes with them, the work that we do together. We, we bring so much to it, each of us, and I am true, I'm not, that's not just saying that, I'm truly inspired by, by these people. Yeah, I'm inspired by the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> I, know you, I know you think I'm kidding, but <laughs> I'm, I'm a, I, I love the feel goods. I love, I love like the huh. And so, if there's any of that in Saru, that was inspired by the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> and let's get to the last question. No pressure. No, no, no pressure at all. No. Hey guys. I love you so much for bringing hope in our homes um, during you know a time that that that's. That's difficult at times, so you know, thank you so much for all of that. Um, another thing I wanted to just say is that, like, I think it's great that gay men are, are playing gay roles, and it's you know a time where things are changing despite everything else that we see. Um, but the thing I wanted to ask is, uh, who's the prankster of the group, and uh, who, who, and what prank did you guys have that might have really, really set you guys off? You guys I, don't I don't know if we prank. I don't know if we prank a lot. It's more just we yeah, scare. Yeah. We're together. We just I knew it was you. Yeah. Well, but Sinequa Sine Sine likes to like lie in wait and scare you, like jump on you, like when you least expect it and startle you. That's one thing. We have more like inside joke stuff. So like one that's very popular at the moment as we go through phases is a blow dart game where if somebody goes. You have to take the blow dart. Like you can't ignore it. You have to go down. And everybody does it, and it's you know, yeah. You have to. So that's sort of the, the way that we, we joke around. Absurd, uh, convoluted inside jokes. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Let's get it.